Welcome back, students. In this chapter, we're going to explore how different quantum mechanical operators interact with each other. I think that at this point, you are all somewhat familiar with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, and you probably know this principle as we cannot know both a particle's position and its momentum at the same time. In this chapter, we're going to look at what the origin behind this principle is and what consequences it has on quantum mechanics. So uh, the learning goals for today are going to be to evaluate the commutators of two operators. So we'll see that this is the tool by which we can just uh, determine if we can know two observables simultaneously. Um, and then we're going to get to the actual Heisenberg uncertainty principle. We'll look at a, a physical example of this, the stern gerlach experiment. And then we'll mention Schrodinger's cat at the end as sort of a funny thought experiment that kind of demonstrates the weirdness of all of this stuff. So at the base level, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle means that we cannot describe a quantum mechanical particle completely unlike a classical particle. So if you think back to classic, uh, classic physics and your physics classes, um, you were probably tasked with finding things like the position, velocity, kinetic energy, and so on of a particle moving along some trajectory, and you could describe that trajectory. In quantum mechanics, we can't do that. There is some sort of fundamental uncertainty between some kinds of quantum mechanical observables. Uh, and it turns out that it is only some kinds. So how do we tell whether or not we can know two observables simultaneously? And to do that, we'll have to evaluate the commutator. So let's think about that here. So what happens if we were to operate on a wave function with operator A? If we do that, and we've done this kind of stuff in class, we're going to return some eigenvalue of that operator. So if we have our wave function, we operate it on operator A, we try to measure, say, the momentum. We return some momentum value that's an eigenfunction of the momentum operator. Now, what happens if then, after doing that measurement, we seek to operate it uh, with a different uh, eigenfunction. We try to find a different observable. So if we operate with another operator B, and if our wave function is still an eigenfunction of that operator B, we'll return a new constant Bn. So in this case, uh, we return two constants because our wave function was an eigenfunction of both operators. And what this means is that since our wave function is an eigenfunction of both the operators we're trying to identify the observables for, doing the measurement didn't actually change the wave function. And we could know both values simultaneously. And we've seen these kind of things in class, but if our wave function is not an eigenfunction of the operator we try to use, any attempt to measure that value will change the wave function, will force it into a different state, a different eigenfunction of that operator. And we won't be able to know both these measurements simultaneously because, for example, doing this measurement A will change the wave function so that it's B is different than it was before. And we can, we can see some examples of this both in terms of math and in terms of, of experiments. So we'll start out by looking at this uh, with math. So the way that we'll describe if we can know two observables at the same time is by evaluating the commutator. And so this is the commutator here. We write this as the eigenfunction A, comma, eigen, the, the operator A, comma, operator B, operating on some function. And here again, our F is just standing for an arbitrary function. Now, if the, eigen, if the function is an eigenfunction of both these operators, the operation will return two constants and the order of operations won't matter. And so if we take the difference between these two, which we abbreviate with this symbol here, we'll end up with the zero. So if the commutator is zero, we say that the operators commute and we can and, and doing two measurements won't change the wave function such that we can know their uh, their uh, observables simultaneously. So let's go ahead and check this out with the most well-known uh, example of the uncertainty principle that is position and momentum. So in this case here, we can see our uh, momentum operator and our position operator. And we can look at these and go in and say, okay, what is their commutator? So remember the commutator here is gonna be, 
we write it as this. So P of X and then X operating on an arbitrary function F of X. If we return zero, it means we can know these both at the same time. We know from a Heisenberg uncertainty principle that we can't know both of these at the same time. So we do not expect this to return zero. So let's go ahead and evaluate it. So first we will operate on our function f of x with our operator uh, p of x. And so to operate on this, we need to take a uh, negative i h bar and then one derivative with respect to x of our function f of x. So that's simply equal to negative, well, I guess I've written it out already. So it's just negative i h bar d dx of our function. Now to operate on this with our x operator, so we'll hit this after we've already operated on it with our momentum operator. That's simply multiplication by x. So we'll get negative i h bar x and then df of x dx. And this is the result of, of doing the operations in this order. What would happen if we were to do it in the other order? So instead, we'll operate first with x. So operating on our arbitrary function f of x with x just returns x f of x. And then if we operate on that with our momentum operator, uh, we'll see that now we have a different thing. So now we have to do the uh, product rule because we have two functions. So we'll have negative i h bar, and then we'll need to take a single derivative of x f of x. And using the product rule, this will give us, uh, we'll say uh, x times d f of x, dx, and then we'll have plus f of x times the derivative of x, which is 1. And so in this case, our, our, when we operate on the function in the opposite way with position first and then momentum, we return negative i h bar x df of x dx plus, I guess rather minus, i h bar uh, f of x. And so when we evaluate the commutator in this way with momentum first, what we have to do is we take uh, the, this operation and put it first, and then we subtract in this uh, result. So then to evaluate the commutator, uh, we simply have uh, negative, i h bar x df of x dx minus i h bar f of x and then minus negative i h bar x df of x dx. So these terms will cancel and we'll end up with negative i h bar f of x. So we can see in this case that we are not left with zero and our two operators do not commute. That is, we cannot know both the position and the momentum simultaneously because the commutator does not return a zero. Um, also note that what well, I've kind of written this in the, in the wrong way. So the best way to write this is simply negative i h bar. Uh, we don't write this arbitrary function f of x in the evaluation of the commutator. Um, another important note, this is the way that if you're looking at the slides you'll see, is that if we were to reverse this, so if we were to do x and then p of x, we return i h bar. Uh, so we return the opposite sign, of course, as all we're doing is changing the order in which we subtract these things. So the, and again, the sign of the commutator isn't really important. Um, what's important is, is it zero or is it not zero? If it's zero, the, op the operators commute. We can know both of their observables at the same time. If it's not zero, they don't commute, and we cannot know both of their observables at the same time. So you'll go through an example of this on the homework problem for class. Now let's go back to the slides and we'll talk about a physical example, an experimental result that shows uh, this, uh, this result. So we'll talk here about the Stern-Gerlach experiment. Um, so this experiment is, uh, is capable of showing this weird property uh, about uh, our, our quantum mechanical observables. So in this experiment, silver atoms are shot through this magnetic field 
And if we were to grab our periodic table and look at the, the electron configuration for silver, you'll find that everything is full except for a single 5s1 electron. So it has one unpaired electron and electrons have spin up, spin down. You remember this from Gen Chem. And we'll go into much more gruesome detail about the origins of electrons spin up and spin down uh, in a couple of weeks here. But suffice it to say that these silver atoms have spin up or spin down electrons. And when the, the silver atoms are subjected to this magnetic field, that becomes apparent. So what this is doing is it's measuring the spin up or spin down component of the electron. And we'll call that M sub Z here. And so we have two options. Those are the only two eigenvalues that we could measure for our electron spin operator. They're either spin up or spin down. Uh, here, and here we're talking about the Z direction. And so here we can see an example of their actual experiment, their detection paper, where in the absence of magnetic field, their silver atoms all hit in the same spot. And then in the presence of magnetic field, they split into spin up and spin down physically. So in their experiment, what they did is they took this uh, setup and they separated silver atoms into spin up and spin down. They're probing this MZ, you can call it the Z dimension here of our electron spin. Then they took another set of magnets and checked a different orientation. So here, they're checking, again, the same kind of thing. Again, there's only two options. There's spin up or spin down. Um, and in here, since they've turned it, we're probing a different direction. So we're no longer probing the Z dimension. We're probing, say, the X dimension. And what they observe is the same thing. It splits into either spin in or spin out. Uh, so it's the same kind of experiment, but they're just separating into which of the two electron spins do you have. Now, if these operators commute and we could know simultaneously both the MZ component and the MX component of the uh, orbital angular momentum for the electron, if we were to apply this again, we would expect that since we've only caught the spin up one, they would all still have spin up. However, when the, the vertical magnets are applied again, the, the, the silver atoms again separate into spin up and spin down. So something about this second measurement here reset the wave function and such that it's no longer simply all spin up at electrons, spin up silver atoms. So we can see that this second experiment has changed the magnetic moment of the, or of the orbital angular momentum of the electron in the Z direction, such that it is both up and down again when probed in this third experiment. So this shows us that these two operators don't commute. And that's what it means when two operators don't commute. So with this observation in theory in mind, let's continue on to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So Heisenberg's uncertainty principle states that the uncertainty in position, which we denote here as delta x times the uncertainty in momentum, is always greater than Planck's constant uh, over, over 2 pi, so h bar over two. And this means that we can't know both the position and the momentum. So we found that the commutator was not zero. And again, we, we can't know both of these two things at the same time. However, the uncertainty is pretty small. So this uncertainty is uh, roughly Planck's constant over two. So it's something like 10 to the minus 30 Four. So for macroscopic objects, we the uncertainty in their position, right? If you're saying we don't know where something is, it might be 10 to the minus 20 meters over, you know, that doesn't really matter. We know exactly where it is. I also want to emphasize that this is just the, the most classic example of uncertainty. There are other uncertainty relations that can be derived for various uh, operators. Um, so, for example, uh, there's an uncertainty in terms of energy and time, and you can derive that uncertainty by basing it off of this uncertainty principle. Um, now, something interesting about this relationship is that it suggests a trade-off. So I think the, the colloquial kind of definition of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is that if we, we can't know the position and the momentum. So if we know the momentum, we can't know the position. But what this actual mathematical relationship suggests is that it should be possible to 
learn less about the momentum and in doing so learn more about the position. So using these as an example on a quantum mechanical free particle, again, with the wave function that looks like this, uh, we've done this in class where we looked at the uh, probability of locating the particle and found that we had no way of knowing where the particle was inside its interval. So we knew nothing about its position. However, if we were to operate on this function with the momentum operator, which is a single derivative, we would find that we get uh, hk or h bar k times the wave function. In other words, our, this function is an eigenfunction of the momentum operator, and we exactly know its momentum. So if this is our quantum mechanical wave function, we exactly know its momentum and we know nothing about its position in exact uh, accordance with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So is there a way in which we could know less about its momentum? And it turns out that there is. So let's go into Desmos here to do an example of this. So what we have here is an example of a, a wave. So here is our wave. And this wave corresponds to that function there. Now, with the, I have it as cosine kx. So it is a real version of that imaginary function. And we can see again that we have no way of identifying where our particle is. It has an even chance of essentially being anywhere in this interval, especially if the interval was larger than this. Now, what would happen if we made this wave function a superposition? And so that's what I'm doing down here. You can see we have this sum. Right now, A is set to zero, so there's no sums uh, going in here. But if I were to bring A into one, it would add in two more terms, going from negative one to one. And here we have this zero. So we would add in two more terms as we were as we increase this. And what would that do to our momentum? Well, if we added in two more terms, we would no longer know what the momentum was, right? So in this case, uh, before we added any other terms, this is our function. We take one uh, derivative of this and we return uh, a function. So our, our momentum is h bar k naught. If I add in two more terms where I'm changing k naught, now I have two more potential momentums, two more eigenvalues that I could measure. So I go from being certain about my momentum to being somewhat uncertain about my momentum. Now, instead of having one value, I could have potentially one of three values. And what does that do to the position? So let's increase A to one. And we see that we have introduced some position dependence. So here, this point is it's, it's higher than over here, where we're at 1.608, which is 1.778. So our particle is much more likely to be centered around x equals zero than to be further out. Now, as you can imagine, if I were to increase this a here, add more and more wave vectors together, um, I would get more and more localization. So if I go from a equals uh, to a equals three, or let's go up to five even, now I'm adding in 10 more functions. So now my momentum is only one out of 11 choices. And you can see my position is even more narrowed down into x equals zero. And of course, as I add more and more and more and more, we see a localization. So at this extreme here, I'm much more likely to be at x equals zero than anywhere else in this interval. And I have, in fact, lost all knowledge of my momentum. So now I'm very uncertain about momentum, and I am kind of certain about position. So that here, here we can actually show this trade-off between momentum and position. Uh, and that's what this, uh, this image shows here. Um, so this is a, a kind of a sum of all these different waves together. And here you can see what the position would look at. Again, it's just a, a, a static image of the demo we just did on Desmos. So by losing uncertainty in one respect, we can actually gain some information about uh, what we didn't know before. And again, I want to emphasize that this function where we add multiple eigenfunctions together is not an eigenfunction of the uh, momentum operator anymore. And that's what introduces this uncertainty. So uh, I'll mention briefly here Schrodinger's cat, and we can talk about this in class. And I would encourage you to look through the supplemental section 17.5 in the textbook uh, about Schrodinger's cat. Um, so this experiment is is a way in which we can imagine 
what's happening in quantum mechanics. It's a pretty bizarre situation. So what we have here is a particle in a three-dimensional box. Um, and you can see, just like we, we would expect, it's more likely to be in the middle of the box for all three dimensions. We did this kind of math before. Now, imagine we inserted an infinite potential barrier in there, and that's going to divide this particle into two sections. It's going to divide the probability density. Uh, now, this happens despite having only a single particle. So a, a normal person would say, well, there's a 50% chance that the particle is in the left side, and there's a 50% chance it's in the right side. But what we're saying in quantum mechanics, again, to be difficult, and, and then this is the way the observations seem to work, is that the particle is 50% in each side of the box. Now, if we separated the boxes, and there would still be 50% of the wave function in each box until we observed, and then the particle would be either in the box or out of the box, and the wave function would change simultaneously. So again, this is, the, the, this is what quantum mechanics seem to describe. It's hard to accept. And Schrodinger proposed this thought experiment about a cat to sort of uh, ridicule this idea. And of course, it hasn't quite worked out that way. Uh, but Schrodinger's cat says, uh, the experiment is you have a cat in a box, you have a radiation source that has a, a one hour half-life. After an hour, there's a 50% chance that that uh, isotope has decayed. If it decays, it releases this hammer which breaks a violet poison that kills the cat. So after an hour, is the cat alive or dead? And a normal person would say, well, it's, we don't know, 50% chance of it being dead. But again, the quantum mechanical results seem to suggest that until we do an observation on our quantum mechanical particles, they are both and rather than either or. And so Schrodinger says the cat can't be both alive and dead. This quantum mechanics is silly. And uh, that, that does, you know, that, that works for cats, but cats are macroscopic objects. So to apply this to microscopic objects doesn't quite work as well as we would like. Um, so the conclusions here for this, this section are that we can't know some observables at the same time. We can gauge the commutator uh, to try to figure out if we can know two of these observables at the same time. Um, and then we can also uh, use uh, the, the ideas we've talked about to determine that we can know more about one thing and then we learn less about the other thing. So if we lose information about, say, the position, we can gain information on the momentum and vice versa. Uh, we used the, the stern gerlach experiment as an example to demonstrate these weird principles that we're discussing. And then we briefly talked about Schrodinger's cat uh, to see just, again, the weirdness of quantum mechanics if we try to apply it to a macroscopic scale. So I'll, I'll stop here. And after this lecture, we are going to go into some actual chemical stuff. Um, so on, uh, in the next class period, we will begin to look at quantum mechanical vibration, which will be our first application into uh, spectroscopy. So look forward to that. And I'll see you guys in class.